Uh, hello and welcome uh, to another Creative Career Talk. My name is Andrew Macklin. I'm an actor and a qualified career coach working with creatives all through the arts, medias and cultural sectors, uh, wherever they may be found. Uh, today, I am very gratefully uh, joined by actor, writer, uh, lecturer, clown, uh, fending, uh, founding member of uh, an artistic director of the multi-award winning Barabbas Theatre Company. Uh, um, and well, also a writer and actor who's performed across uh, America, Europe, Ireland, also a teacher and lecturer, uh, lecturing at the Lear in Dublin, the Gate in Dublin, as well as Trinity University and many other universities throughout the UK and beyond. And most recently, uh, Raymond Keane, you've just been directing a piece for 14 Voices from a Bloody Field, which was in commemoration of the 14 uh, innocent people who were at a, uh, an All-Ireland GAA match, not all, yeah, GAA match in Dublin back uh, in 1920 when they were massacred. Uh, and that was, yeah, that went online, I think on the weekend on Friday and it was, it was beautiful. What was your, what was your experience of, of directing that in, an, in a nutshell? Uh, it was a wonderful experience, actually. What a great project, you know, to, to marry two of our largest cultural institutions, one being of sport and one being, of course, of theatre, the Abbey Theatre, National Theatre and GAA, the Gaelic Athletic Association, which is, you know, in every vein within us throughout the country, every small town, every, every small community. Um, so a beautiful marriage uh, to commemorate that event you know, which was termed our first Bloody Sunday. Of course, we have a second one, which was later in the 70s, wasn't it? In the north of Ireland, in Belfast. Uh, another atrocity, unfortunately. But in this one, 14 people, as you say, lost their lives. Innocent people, you know, some, maybe not so innocent. Uh, particularly my guy, he was an active IRA volunteer, go, but going to the match on Sunday afternoon. It was a challenge match between Dublin and Tipperary. So the Abbey Theatre commissioned and the GA commissioned 14 writers, 14 directors and 14 actors. Uh, I was one of those directors uh, and I directed a Billy Roach script, a Wexford man, about a character called Thomas Ryan, who was also a Wexford man, who was an active volunteer, but was going to the match for a day out. You know, he ended up being shot while whispering an act of contrition into Mick Hogan's ear who was the captain of the Tipperary team, who had been shot. And he, he was shot himself while doing that as one of those extraordinary, precious things, you know. Um, um, uh, my actor was Maud Dunford, who would be probably well known to your British audiences now, is, uh, you know, doing very well on film. Uh, so we went about it and we shot all 14 of them over two days in Croke Park, which none of the people would have been there in the modern Crow Park or whatever, but it kind of as a reflection on it. So it was a very beautiful project, a very beautiful project for, I think, the, uh, the Irish nation. And it had a huge viewership because of the GA, of course, because it's in every vein and artery in within our country. Uh, and it, it has opened the conversation again about or some, you know, they say it was a turning point in Irish history, as in Irish England relationships, you know, uh, relationships. So it's one of those significant events that, you know, we haven't really dealt with. And uh, if we're any good in the arts world, you know, uh, if we are good at reopening wounds and uh, having another poke inside to see what we need to deal with whether it's hurt, pain, shame, mm -hmm. all the parts of ourselves that are worthwhile. I, I thought I, when I saw it, and I thought it was beautifully done to hear, because I guess what theatre can do that history can't is allow you to speak those voices reflectively back on their experience. And I think they were great in that uh, the reflective experience was to some ways quite humorous and joyous and, and mixed in with that real bitter sweetness of what was actually going on. But I think you're right in that it's allowing people to relook really at that time in, an, in a new way, a, a much more human way, perhaps, without the context of what was going on at the time. But just to, I guess, move us from 
tragedy to comedy, perhaps, or I, I don't think you can separate the two really, Raymond. I'd be interested to hear what you think about that. But um, I, I, I first came, I guess, to, to, to know you through doing one of your amazing workshops, um, I a Clown. I, I'd done a little bit of clown beforehand, but I, I'd never spent a week getting into it in full depth. And what was fascinating about it, for me at least, was that it was a world that I, I, I didn't know a lot about. And I think we have a very common conception of what clown, inverted commas, is. Um, and this was something very different. And it's always stayed in my head as I think you, that workshop uh, and clown perhaps to a degree as well does what theatre should do as well, which speaks as much to life and how you should live it as it does to art and how you should make it to, uh, that was my sense at least at the end. But I guess for you that, how would you go about describing what theatre of the clown or what clown in your conception is? Hey, I'll try my best. <clears throat> it's lots of things. Uh, let me just go back to, you know, you brought the phrase, the comedy and tragedy of life. Let's bring that back into the picture as a beginner, you know, or it's our symbol, isn't it? The comedy of tragedy, the happy, sad mask of theatre. It's our icon, so to speak, you know, uh, you know, and that's where we operate. With, and there is no fun without tears, no, you know, no tears without laughter or whatever. Um, and then go across to the the the, the clown, and we, you know, I would say there, you know, I, I can do many quotes for you. I suppose other people's quotes, but this is one that I've come up with that sits well with me. And I would say that clown is the mask behind and through which is revealed the very essence of our greatness and our fragility, side by side, so to speak. You know, um. So it is a journey, I guess, and I call it a journey because I'm still on a journey. I'm 63 years of age now, and I've been a, attracted to the clown world from the age of about 20-ish or something, maybe a little 21 or something like that. Something drew me towards this nature of being. Uh, here I am now, you know, 43 years, how many is it? 43 years later, still on that journey to, you know, eke out, make sense of, make nonsense of it, perhaps, um, and find out what is the clown? What's the clown's role in society as well as theater? What is it? What does it mean to me as I grow older, as I gather some new information, which I do every time I teach it, in particular every time I do it every day of my life, I guess I reflect on the clown and its nature and its meaning. I, you've heard me say it before, you know, I, you know, kind of I use a paradox sometimes, you know, you know, clown is everything that I am and nothing that I am, or it's all that I am and not my, I don't, you know, it's, but it certainly has, I have adopted the nature of clown or the process of clown or the journey of clown into my, my own philosophical way of being, which is, you know, we're getting very, it sounds terribly serious, okay? I mean, it should be a laugh too. If it doesn't make you laugh, it's not clown. The clown proposes, you know, through the red nose masks, let's say the one we know most of, a clown doesn't always have to wear a mask, but it is the fundamental kind of, you know, tool or, or what we all consider when we think of clown is the red nose, you know, um, the mask. The smallest mask in the world, as Jacques Lecoq would have called it, in uh, uh, one of the great, you know, yeah, great uh, journeymen of clown in European European traditions, anyway. Um, uh, the mask, the mask. So, you know, the mask of theatre, the mask of self. You know, so through the mask, we say we kind of reveal ourselves. We think masks cover us up, and if the red nose mask is anything, it is the one that reveals us most. Let's consider if you were to do a character mask, you know, as we know throughout the world. And, you know, what's our obsession with masks anyway, since day one, you know, in Stone Age times or whatever, you know, we picked up a rock and we banged it off another, and we got a bit of a rhythm going, and then we started to dance to that rhythm. And then sooner, very soon afterwards, we started making masks and donning them. Mm -hmm. the other self, a way of ritualizing humanity or ourselves to play it out, to play out 
what it is to exist. So the red nose mask, whenever that appeared, was another way of looking at the fool, if you like, the, the clown, the one who makes laugh, the one who falls down, or the one who uh, reveals failure, mistake, consequence. So that's just, you've already painted such a picture and what comes across, I guess, from hearing you speak about it again and from being in the workshop, which I think sticks in your head over time, certainly as a performer and as a human in life, the philosophical element. And there's something for me, at least in my experience of it, that, that kind of said that clown was such a complete uh, experience of what being human was. So mm -hmm. it is so it playing in the dark and the imperfection and the bits behind the mask or nose that I guess predominantly we don't necessarily show. And my experience, at least in the workshops was, and I think in, in playing with some of those techniques is allowing yourself to play and experience those other imperfect nervous, that the bits that you would choose to hide behind. And what's interesting, I think, from what you were saying there about, once again, that, you know, the, the red nose being the smallest mask, that in some way it's actually a, a way of showing more of yourself than mm. perhaps you would normally allow yourself to show even as an actor, I guess. Um, and, and there's something that you brought up there that I thought was key that also stayed with me. Uh, uh, definitely the way failure is looked at from the perspective of clown and how it's dealt with in theater of the clown, because I guess a lot of people that I would work with and talk to, and even in my own life, dealing with failure, I think as a creative person in the world is a, a fairly consistent challenge and I definitely left that workshop with a new conception of failure mm -hmm. uh, as something to, to be worked through. Uh, there was a, a real sense, I can remember I had done a small scene and it hadn't worked well and no one laughed. And I'm sure this happens a lot in all of your workshops. Oh, and I can remember going to leave. <laughs> all the time. I can remember going to leave the stage and I can remember you saying, no, stay, stay. You can't leave an audience with this. You, and, and work through it and by sticking with it and working through it of course a little moment of comedy genius arrived so i wonder if you could speak a little bit about yeah how that sense of dealing with failure in clown or perhaps theater traverses over to life in your experience sure and um, <clears throat> i suppose the, the the core element of what clown is that we come face to face with ourselves because let's say as an actor, you play other characters. We say in clown, it is you. So it is all of you, you know, and if we can think of the, the circle of the nose and the circle of life, it's the circle of life, yeah. You know, clown is all of us in all our beauty, joy, love, truth, vulnerability, gullibility, stupidity. Some people say clowns are stupid. They are because humans are stupid, but it's only one element of them. They're stupid, they make mistakes. And we love to laugh at others who make mistakes because it means it's not us <laughs> making the mistake, but we know deep down it is, you know, oh my God, yes, I do that. You know, stupidity down into failure. And then I go a step forward to say divine failure. Now, whatever that means for you right now, just let that sit. And then we go down deeper into this bottom of the circle into what, let's call them the seven deadly sins, those greed, lust, sloth, you know, but all those, the darker side of the soul, so to speak. And, but then it's a circle. So it goes all the way back up to the love, joy, truth. And that's the makeup of us. You could put another million terms and words in there of what we are. Well, we are. Um, you know, resi you know, resilience and all those things, and whatever the clown does, as you know, he, he, you know, Beckett totally gets the clown. Like, you know, I can't go on. I will go on, no matter what we go on. It's the that's human nature. But in in our journey into clown, in order to be able to, I suppose, reflect what it is to be human back to our audiences or with our audience, for and with our audience because it is a conversation and the clown is the ultimate conversation. In fact, I would say the clown is the ultimate metaphor for what we do, mm -hmm. the theater, the mask, the actor, the whatever else, you know, it's the ultimate met metaphor because the clown is the play, the player and the conversation. So 
in the journey of plan, of course, we come face to face with ourselves in all of those areas, ideally, mm -hmm. so that we know them, so that we are, you know, in some way expert at reflecting them back in an authentic manner. So we open the conversation with those we share the theater with uh, or the process with our audiences and ourselves. So that's not easy coming face to face. It can be a bit therapeutic. It's a dangerous thing. You know, I mean, you know, people often say, oh my God, is this like therapy? Yeah, it is, but it's not, you know, and certainly don't treat me as your therapist. I'll completely fuck you up. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it is by its nature, all art is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. By its nature, art is therapeutic because it's essentially a reflection on self from what it is to be human. And uh, and that could be a, a painting on a, on a gallery wall that it might make you just feel and think differently about something, you know, or a song or a poem or a, a film or a stage show or a moment in a stage show, one moment. Uh, very often is the thing that just goes, oh, that's another way of looking at that particular thing, you know. And it's generated within yourself. If we get it right as, as theatre practitioners, clowns, dancers, doers or whatever, if we get it right, if we get the bubble right for you to exist within, then this is my, my wish is that, you know, you get time to reflect on how you feel so you know, I'm not telling you how to, you know, because I'm not good at telling people how to think. Maybe I am, but I don't wish to do it in theatre. I really would prefer to open up a space that, you know, that it, you know, through our hearts, essentially, you know, rather than through the mind, because you can never trust the mind. Mind is fucked up, <laughs> you know, but somewhere in the holistic self, in our bodies, we're in a place of truth and understanding, a deeper understanding. So it could be a fart gag, or it could be, you know, something as profound as a Beckett piece of theater for me. And somewhere oscillating between the two is a lovely place to be. And it is a shared space, a shared thinking, a shared feeling. And maybe we all move on together mm -hmm. or move to the next level. I mean, I, I can definitely, that sense of, you were talking about, you know, not, telling people what to think or what to do. I, I, I definitely think that, you know, adults don't enjoy that being told what to do. And I think clown, like you say in theatre, allows that space for people to mm. make their own decisions on that, at a safe space and decide where they want to go. And I think there was something in, in that circle that you were pointing towards that kind of rung a bell in, in my head around, you know, that full experience that actually what, what performing clown and what clown philosophy, so to speak, how it transfers in, in my own sort of way of thinking is that I, I guess career wise or working in the arts, there can be a sense that we can't accept any sense of being stupid, failing, not being good enough, that these are aspects that are, I guess, in clown, natural parts of the circle. But often, I think for us working as theatre artists, something that we might openly deny and repress. You can mm. see that the nice job I did and the wonderful show reel and the nice play that got the awards, but I'm not going to let you see the other elements. And I think what Clown says, to me at least, is that you need a whole perspective. You need to, in some way, acknowledge and own the failures in order to have those other, in order to go on and must go on, as, as you say as well. And you mentioned there about that journey that you were on, <laughs> that, that's got a couple of years behind it, Raymond. Uh, and so I wonder, I mean, you know, when I was doing my leaving cert and finishing secondary school, clown wasn't one of the options, neither, neither was acting. But I guess I'm intrigued to find out for you, wh where did that begin? I know we talked a little bit before we came on as to, I guess, your upbringing and some of the variety within that. But I'm wondering, when for you did you kind of decide, yeah, the stage, something about this world, something about clown is is a good direction for me to move in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I used the phrase earlier, I'll start with it again. You know, some, we know that we know the phrase accidental activist. Um, I would say I'm an accidental artist. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start, you know, kind of later in life than, than we spoke earlier, whatever, even though I'm 
if we have time, we can go back there as well or, or not, maybe. Um, but I was a hairdresser and I was a hairdresser, it began in Ireland and then quickly went to, began in Cork. I'm from Waterford, Dungarvan County, Waterford, moved to Cork to become an apprentice hairdresser, did 11 months there, went to their school in Dublin, was Peter Marks, you know, came back after six weeks training, left the job, went to London, you know, typical of me, you know, without being prepared. Yeah, I'm a trained hairdresser, you know, and off I went to London. Spent some time there, uh, London in the 70s, you know, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. I remember those signs were still up on hostels and B&Bs or whatever. Um, and it was the time, a mixed up time. I should, what did I know about Irish or English politics? But I was feeling it, you know, but anyway, it was an interesting time. I spent about a year and a half there and then went to Amsterdam, then came back to London for a year and a half, then went back to Amsterdam again. So somewhere in the middle of that, I was in Amsterdam and one weekend I went down to Paris with my then girlfriend, who was madly in love with, who was a, at the age of 19, a radical feminist. So that was a whole new world to, to, uh, to be privileged, to be uh, dragged in by the scruff of the neck and uh, challenged me to my core. So we were down in Paris one weekend for a, a bit of a skype from Amsterdam and I saw performers outside the Pompidou Centre people who may have been students in Marceau or Jacques Lecoq or, you know, uh, uh, you know, and out busking, so to speak, you know, but they're just entertaining the crowds. And I was just absolutely transfixed by them. I'd never seen anything like this. I might have seen something maybe back in Amsterdam, similar as well, street theatre, whatever. But I was immediately, you know, going, this is the most extraordinary thing. And they were often working without words and they were communicating and, you know, have, you know, creating this space where laughter and joy and, you know, provocation and stupidity and, I mean, I was completely, you know, uh, it was the circus, you know, uh, and it was almost the moment I, I want to run away with the circus. So back to Amsterdam, I went, found a book on mime in the Milky Way, it's called this big sort of hippie club back in those days, slightly more hip now than hipper, hip than hippie. Um, uh, and I found this workbook by Samuel Avital, Samuel Avital uh, who, and it was a workbook to teach mime. So I started teaching myself mime in front of the mirror back in the, in the flat and uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, happened to be sharing a flat with a guy called Finn Fitzgerald, whose brother was Sandy Fitzgerald, who ran the Grapevine Arts Centre here in Dublin on North Frederick Street. And they had a theatre company headed up by Tom McGinty. Do you remember the Dice Man? And all nine of them came to Amsterdam to do a show on the Milky Way, and all of them stayed on our kitchen floor. It was, I mean, one of those crazy times. Kind of, what the hell is this? So Tom McGinty, the Dice Man, saw my book and I had bought all this expensive makeup that I'd never used because I hadn't gotten to that stage yet. I was teaching myself, you know, stillness and movement and animal study or whatever, all, you know, from the book as, as best I could. I had done one mime class in, in Amsterdam, but I didn't have enough Dutch to really understand what was going on. So I gave that up. Uh, but Tom saw this and he said, forget all that. And he painted my face gave me a jacket, a kind of a drummer boy jacket and an imaginary bugle, he called it, and brought me out onto Dam Square to perform with them. I couldn't look at you back then. I was so introvert, Irish boy. I couldn't look you in the eye. And I went out onto Dam Square with my heart, not only in my mouth, but you know, bouncing along the street behind me. And uh, that was it, I kind of, I suppose it had happened already in, in Paris when I saw them. So I thought, I'm going to do this. Back to Dublin, a year or so later. And I used to go out onto Grafton Street uh, doing robotics and stillness and mucking about and playing with the audience. And, you know, back then it was very new, in the 70s, you know, very new, early 80s maybe. Um, in Dublin, Tom would have been known for his Dice Man character, but, and you know, 
suddenly I was, you know, performing, which was extraordinary, you know, with enough skills that I had taught myself sooner. After that, I, I joined the Oscar Mime Company, began to train properly, but I was doing that first. So what would bring a small town, you know, runt in the family, ridiculously introverted, you know, low self-esteem you could possibly imagine, you know, uh, out onto the streets. Mm -hmm. it, they say, you know, in the, Oscar Wilde says, you know, the stage is the shy man's revenge on the world, you know. So, well, I can, I could definitely attest to that. Uh, what, what, what's, what sticks out, what, what sticks out, just hearing you say that or recount it, is one the sense of um, that amazement or curiosity of seeing those first performers in Paris, but, but then the, you know, self-teaching yourself, Mom. So there wasn't a sense of well, I need to wait to get to a specific school, a specific time, I need to do this well. It was, a book was found and practiced. No, I was stupid enough to do that. You see, it's brilliant. Stupidity is a great thing. I think we'll, we'll come back to stupidity because I think it's key. Um, so there's that element of, of you just starting, which then seemed to align perfect timing when these nine visitors arrive on the kitchen floor. Uh, and then I think there is something really key in what happened next, which is that sense of having the imaginary bugle but none of the, uh, you know, experience. So being thrust completely out of your comfort zone. Um, and, and I guess there was something in that, I think for all of us, because I think we can very easily get a sense of what we can do and stick in that world of this is what I do. It will be irrational to move into the world of what I got no experience in, but it sounds like your experience of being thrown out into that world with an imaginary bugle was that, you know, there was innate capability that suddenly you know, as happens every time someone steps on stage, I think it, you're suddenly in a world of, of, of doing and actually you, you have the skills for that. So those are what comes out to me from that. And you mentioned stupidity. And I think it's something that comes up again and again when you tell someone that you're involved, I guess, in the arts in any way, shape or form, especially in a, in a predominantly capitalist society. Why would you? Uh, but what are for you then? We all know the downsides of stupidity. But I think they're, they can be mixed. So, you know, stupidity might say, don't, starting something too early, buying the makeup without having the skills to do it might be stupid or it might be paving the way. Um, imaginary bugles might be stupid or they might be opening a door to a career. So for you, when does stupidity, what's the value of stupidity career-wise or, or being in the arts? I suppose we take leaps, don't we? We jump off the cliff, which reminds me, and you've, I, you may have heard me say this in class because I say it all the time. I bore myself repeating myself, but you know, I often, I often introduce myself. I'm a clown who aspires to being a fool. So what is the fool? I mean, they're all the same family, aren't they? Clowns, fools, you know. Buffons, Jester, I don't know, you know, all similar in there. But let's, uh, let's I, maybe I put the fool up there as a kind of a, a, a place to reach to because I probably am too cowardly to go there. Most of us are, I think, to be the fool. And what is the fool? You know, in ancient imageries, images of the fool, um, the fool is depicted naked from the waist down. Or, yeah, most often male, actually always male in ancient. I don't know why that is. But uh, so what does that mean? To be depicted naked from the waist down. So they say the fool goes through the world, uh, naked to the world, thus symbolizing, you know, that the lower is but a reflection of the higher, you know, uh, willing to show what others preferred to hide, essentially. So that's, a, you know, am I brave enough to go there? Sometimes, um, but a lot, no. Um, so, and then if we go across to, you know, what I began with, like jumping off the cliff and the, the, the tarot card, which I know nothing about, by the way, if there's any tarot readers out there, I, you, will, you will, you know, be embarrassed by what I'm next about to say. 
I go to I got obsessed with the fool card in the tarot just because it's the fool card. That's all, you know. Uh, and the fool card is, you know, zero. The void. Okay, that you know, all the cards are numbered. You know, you know, we know zero. You know, was embraced by the Egyptians, but the Greeks didn't couldn't get the notion of what it, zero is in their mathematics, you know what I mean? The void, that you can't have a nothing, you know, uh, it's the circle as well, of course, you know, for me. <laughs> I'm okay, I'm pushing it now. Um, but, you know, what does the, the fool, in the fool card, the fool is depicted at the edge of a cliff. Sometimes with one dog behind, sometimes with two dogs, one barking and one sitting back, going, you know, the one barking saying, you aged, you know, because he's stepping off the cliff or she could be stepping off the cliff. And uh, one dog going, go on, and one dog saying, yeah, you know, you aged, you know, stepping off the cliff. What does that mean? Or living on the edge of a cliff or being willing to take the leap into the unknown. Yes, you could fall you know, down and you could crack your head open, but the crack you'd have on the way would be deadly or the possibility of it. And you may not break your head when you land. You may have had a fantastic ride. And we talk about that in theater terms, don't we? You know, it's, it's like every night nearly, you're stepping off the edge of a cliff. And we should be because that's the importance of it. Will it work tonight? Will I die on stage tonight or will I succeed? Will I fail or succeed? We're always oscillating between the two and that's what makes it so potent for I mean, us and the audience. I remember mean, when you talk about f aspiring to be f a fool and foolishness in that way, uh, it's it's redefined. What, what comes across is it's redefined as, as courage, courage in the face of, of of the unknown. So this, but also stupid enough to have that courage. <laughs> yeah, it's not a safe way of being, is it? Um, and I, I think that a lot of people in the arts might wrestle because I think you know normal society, the majority of it, resists that foolishness, that courage, that sense of doing anything that might be dangerous or out of there. And I think definitely in my own experience, you you come across a lot of reasoning that says you should be a lot more rational and this is clearly foolish and why would you take it but from you know a, i guess a theater perspective or an artistic perspective foolishness is much better understood as that sense of well courage i'm having the courage to do the things i want to do to display the lower naked half <laughs> in yeah. order to admit that it's there and so i think that's a really useful thing perhaps maybe for creatives to to reclaim that sense of foolishness and, and keep yeah. it, as, as you say, uh, as an aspirational thing to, to want to be more foolish and to aspire to the fool. Um, and yeah. to, to run a little bit, to, I know we're jumping over the shop slightly, mm -hmm. uh, but to, to jump a little bit to, to Barabbas, uh, which is a theatre company, 21 years running now? We would be if it were, I still keep the name and the website and et cetera, but I haven't been functioning through it for a number of years now yet. Um, but I mean, that as a theatre company has had such a wide and expansive history and has created such work and I think has, has been really inspirational to a lot of people in Ireland and, and beyond. And I wonder, I guess I would talk to a lot of people and there's a sense with a lot of artists, a, a need for community or, and for a certain sense of security in, with, within which to create something or there is the sense of, in an ideal world, wouldn't it be great to form something like that? But it is too much work, but it is too risky, so on and so forth. And I think it can be, yeah, it can be difficult to see why take on such what might be perceived to be a, such a big challenge sometimes for some people. And so I wonder for you, on reflection, looking at that work and yeah, what did forming that company and working with them what did it give you on reflection? Not, not so much the, you know, the, the ticks on a CV of specific jobs. What's the overall sense, I guess, of, yeah, of being involved with that and creating that and bringing it together and making something in that way? I mean, so much. I couldn't put it in the bag for you. You know, so much it gave me. Um, we formed in 1992. 
two, I think we began the conversation, you know, uh, myself, Michael Murphy and Veronica Coburn, uh, with three pints of naivete, I would say, a good topping of stupidity and innocence abound and a leap into the unknown, I guess, uh, without thinking. You know, there wasn't much thinking done, perhaps, initially. Here's how we began. You know, Michael and Veronica were friends. Uh, all three of us were working on children's television, or I was in children's television, they were in teenage television, whatever, uh, in the same you know, cabin in RT, our national broadcaster. Uh, we knew each other from doing street theatre. We knew each other from doing the odd show about town, where we were mostly cast as the jumpy up and down one or the chimpanzee sniffing somebody's arse or something, you know, uh, you know, club feed or, uh, you know, all sorts of, you know, the, the slightly out there, out there characters, which we embraced. I mean, that's what we wanted to play. Um, so we knew each other. And then Michael and Veronica put together a kind of a series of workshops and invited actors along. You know, if you were around the day, you were you're too young. You, you know, you'd have been invited along. A whole gang of us in a big hall in Pierce Street Community Centre to play for a few weeks and to you bring your skills, Andrew. I bring mine. You know, set up a workshop, show us your stuff. Uh, Michael and Veronica headed it up, you know what I mean? They wanted to do a kids show at the time. They weren't thinking of a company. And at the, they would, you know, they were saying at the beginning, I mean, people like Annie Ryan, Cindy Cummings, these are people that our Irish or Irish community wouldn't know, not necessarily, although you may, in England. Um, uh, they were the sort of happening people we thought, you know, people somewhere in and around the same territory as where, Michael and Veronica were, they instigated physical theatre. Not a term I like terribly because all theatre is physical by its nature, but you know, there was a name, it's now defunct really titled physical theatre. Um, um, so we all played, shared, took it, it was quite serious actually, you know, we, all, you know, we really worked hard and stuff. And Michael Marcus said, you know, out of this, we might invite a few of you along to do our next show, which was a kid's show that they had planned, you know, a uh, small kid's show, whatever. Uh, uh, we don't know. Uh, anyway, at the end of it, they invited me along to do the show. They just decided they would keep it to three people. So, uh, so themselves and myself. And I said, no, thank you very much, but I would be interested in forming a company. I didn't even know what a company was. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know what I was saying, you know. So they went off, had many cups of tea, called me in, more cups of tea. And over a couple of days or, you know, a week or so, with many conversations, we decided we were going to set ourselves up as a company. And we got our title, Barabbas, you know, the one who got away, you know, beautiful name uh, proposed by Michael Murphy at the time. He wanted to call us Barabbas Banana. Myself and Veronica were too posh for the banana, but Barabbas, great sounding name, and the one you imagine we often imagine his face, you know, when Judas said to the crowd, you know, who shall I release? And release Barabbas. You can imagine Barabbas's face, you know, at that moment. So it was kind of fitting for us. And then we then we sat for many cups of tea for a week or so and we decided what we would be. We decided we'd take a year out of practice to be together and work together to get to know each other. My God, when you think of it, you know, I had had my first kid and uh, Veronica was about to and, or had, maybe, you know, was about to, and Michael had two dogs. And we, we laugh about that sometimes, uh, you know, to take ourselves out of employment, to focus on gathering week by week, you know, to find out what we were. Uh, and make shows or make plans or whatever, uh, you know. Uh, so we did, and it was, was kind of crazy, you know. But all that naivety, and then we decided we would, what we, would we be, you know, and it would be an amalgam of our backgrounds. We had, I, we had all done a bit of television at that stage. I'd done a good bit of mime, dance, puppetry, you know. Veronica coming from youth theatre, also kind of the, the hot young thing at the time as an actor, you know, uh, 
Michael from the Lecoq School, you know, so we had this mishmash of stuff that we kind of made a blend of. So there's a whole plethora of stuff was in there from our experiences, but we decided we would say for funding purposes, pick out the sexy names, we would be an Irish company, you know, influenced by Europe, the, the European traditions. It's like as if Ireland isn't in Europe. The European traditions of clown, bouffant, and commedia dell'arte. Mm -hmm. They were sexy and they were new in Ireland, but we would give them an Irish context. And so we went to the Arts Council at Phelan Donlan. There was a time when you could go into the Arts Council and meet Phelan for a coffee up in the, the attic where the theatre section was at the time. You know, our Arts Council then had about three or four million to its name per year, you know what I mean? And you could ask for money and you could say, give us 500 quid or whatever, or, you know, what do we do? And he said, here's 500 quid, go and do something with that, you know, kind of thing. And then over the year, we, we devised three shows, a clown show, a five actor Macbeth, and a show called Half Eight Mass of a Tuesday, which used puppets, miniatures, predominantly non-verbal. And we launched ourselves a year later with three shows back to back. It nearly killed us. We borrowed the money to do it. What would make you borrow money for theatre, you know? And in retrospect, got 10 grand from the Arts Council, which is not a done thing anymore. Retrospect funding. But it was a huge success. Our debut, so to speak, you know. Uh, and we, but the, the, the but the, possibly the main reason why, of course we had you know, similar sensibilities, but it was spending time together in a room playing. Because what do we do? We make plays. How do we do plays? We play plays. This is why we play in the theatre world, isn't it? This is why we play a lot of games, you know what I mean? To play, to learn to be players, to learn to play with each other, to find each other's strengths and weaknesses, to... Uh, to uh, build something of a kind of a cohesion, an ensemble, uh, which it comes out in the work, doesn't it? The more longer you have together as a, as a company of actors, you know, we now do it all the time and for every rehearsal, you know, if we can, if we're lucky to get six weeks rehearsal, you know, very, very rare now, but building the company, building the vocabulary, the physical language between each other. So we're communicating as a kind of an ensemble, a team, a unit, and that comes across, you know, for our audiences then, and it makes for better work. So, you know, that was, that proved, that year proved, you know, huge for us. I mean, also, what, what you know, you know as, as, sorry. I, oh, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. I guess it, just to reflect what comes back when you tell the story is, is very much like you said that year of I think you refer to it as you know taking time to find out who we are then taking time to find out what we will do so there was this period of going well what have we got in the room who are we how do yeah. these things fit together and actually I think significantly more preparation time in that way building a company than I think is often thought about presently I think either whether it be in theatre with like you say a shorter rehearsal period the idea you can just produce this thing overnight, actually what you're describing is, you know, a real process of getting to know who we are in the room, what we can do before then creating what sounded like a big mass of, uh, of, of theatre, three shows back to back. But there was one thing you mentioned and I thought I, I want to jump in here and see if I could get a bit more because I'm curious about it. Uh, you know, you mentioned about you went along to their, uh, their session that they had that said we're doing the kids show and might invite some people back and you were invited to be in the show and there was an impulse to say, I won't do the show, but I want to form a company. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I'm sure, you know, at that point, like you say, there's definitely about, I don't know what the hell a company is, but I wonder what, what do you, what's your sense of what the intention was? What was the impulse behind that? Because clearly there was a decision not to just do a one-off show and, you know, be involved in that. There was something else happening. I wonder what that was. And perhaps in wisdom, in innocence, there's wisdom, isn't there? You know, uh, our an inherent wisdom within us without us being able to articulate it or, or uh, uh, point to it, point it out. But in retrospect, of course, now or some years later, 
I realized it was, I want something meatier than a show. I wanted something that I could, I guess I was searching for something to throw myself into, you know, but it was I think subconscious, unconscious, you know, one of those things that always where the best things are. Um, I need to, and the word solid is coming into my head, something solid. I, mean, um, I had been seven years in young people's television, you know, phased out of that. I don't know, was it to do with life? I don't think so. I mean, it's so crazy to take yourself out of employment. Um, I just had a kid, you know, and I had the support of my then wife, you know, of course, yeah, go for it, you know, but uh, there was a time, it was a time when you could do it as well. I'm not quite sure if I'm answering your direct question. Oh, no, I think you have you. already, but it was a time, you know, there was all these schemes about, you know, a bit like a COVID payment or an unemployment payment, there were these schemes, YES, or these kinds of schemes that we got ourselves onto, there was one down the road. I mean, you're talking like, you know, late eighties or early nineties, you know, we were in depression, you know, we were coming out of the eighties, you know, uh, failure, economic failure, you know, um, of course it took off, took off after the, into mid nineties, late nineties, we were a different, different country it was, you know, we still are because of it, because of that, you know, upsurge or you know extraordinary crazy economy that you know the celtic tiger uh, produced uh, we were pre that mm -hmm. so we were in that place where the, these schemes were employment schemes and there were some to do with theater where theater practitioners musicians whatever would go you know do community work or hospital work or whatever and you'd get 70 quid a week mm -hmm. so we got on to that or maybe might have Varka were on it already and they kind of got me onto it as well uh, so we had 70 quid a week and the person who was running the, co the, co the scheme, if you like, said, I know what you're doing. Just sign on here. Do what you're doing. You don't have to ever have to do a gig for us. I mean, it was really brilliant, actually. This woman, you know, I, I can't even remember her name, but, uh, you know, at the time it was such a, uh, I mean, 70 quid in the early 90s was OK. You know what I mean? Not that we'd all been in RT for years, you know, earning 500 a week. You know what I mean? Like, but... Uh, but yeah, and we pick up a little bit here. We do a few gigs. We do a street gig and we'd pool the money and we'd come out with something or whatever. And, but uh, but it, certainly it was something of a, of, a, of a need to go further than just let's do a kid show. You know I, what I mean? I think what, what, what comes across, I guess, to me hearing you say that is that there was a different level of knowing at play. So hmm. there is that sense of, there's a sort of a cognitive knowing around, yeah, the best next step might be to do something a little bit different, but it sounded like the knowing that you were working on at that point with that decision was a much more sort of, I guess, intuitive sense mm -hmm. of yeah. like, I just know, I don't know why or how, but I've got a clear feeling, gut feeling this is the next thing. And I think that's, um, I think that's really important because I think quite often that is negated as something to be trusted. Quite a lot, I think, people in careers uh, or at any level in, in, in the arts would, I think, often with age too, begin to negate that as an option. I have a strong yeah. feeling towards this, but look, you know, that's, that's to be ignored. Well, you know, I, I don't know what's at the end, so why follow it? I think there's something key in, in, in you listening to that intuitive thing at that point. Um, I wonder, I mean, we're talking about it a little bit earlier before we came on, that I thought was fascinating uh, around... I guess the variety of things that you now do and and from hearing your journey that you have done mm -hmm. and i think what can be i mean you know you you lecture you teach and clown you direct perform write make theater i mean you know the list cut hair maybe potentially still if if, if the opportunity for actors artists whatever you know you, you know, do everything really and so and so with that i guess i'm curious because quite often there can be a very there can be a block for people around the idea of doing something outside of that one thing they're known for doing. I mean, someone else, Raymond, might have very early on said, I'm a hairdresser, that's what I do. 
although I'm interested in mine, that's who I am. Yeah. And I'm sensing is there something different with you that's allowed you to see things differently so that you could form and change and move and adapt and grow into what feels like more of, of what you potentially can do. What's your sense of what's allowed you to do that? Uh, first of all, I should probably uh, qualify it. Is it the best thing? Yes, no. You know, would, we, would I be better off focusing on certain things? Probably, you know, if you think career, you know, good, good career moves, but it's not what I am, you know, it's, uh, and a lot of things have come my way accidentally, you know, or, or have they been sent to me, you know? we look at that universe what is the universe giving me you know and i do believe you know that we are drawn to the things we need mm -hmm. you came to clown class because you needed it mm -hmm. we are you know we we make decisions because this is something of a need within us uh, a place that, a journey we need to take you know and if we say no to it fine you know fine you go a different way you know but some things have come my way like when i was off the job in television i said no because i only do street theater i had this social conscious shit going on in my head you know good shit as well yeah it, that uh you know uh theaters for the people not in theaters theater you know it's better contract in the street you know because people have the decision to stay or go and walk away if they don't like it or whatever so it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, you know it's an equal bargain you know and um, as i did with hairdressing as well because i was cutting hair and training with a guy called Kalichi in dance acting in the grapevine art center when i came back to dublin and i was cutting hair half the time in the art center in the exhibition space in the freezing cold, uh, cutting people's hair, booked out for six weeks in advance because I only did four people a day because it took a long time. It was an hour, maybe more at the time. But I had the social conscience with it as well, if you know, you know uh, going on, which to do with the lefty politics that I was perhaps, you know, touched with from Dave's in Amsterdam and Ulton, whatever, and, and Great Pine Arts Centre, kind of a sense of fairness, a sense of equal opportunity, whatever. And I was spending an hour or more per person on hair. I was passionate about hair. I'm as passionate about hair as I am about clown. It's the same thing. It's about the conversation, the mask as well. Um, and having the conversation with people about hair was where we would get to a place where I could do something that would work for you. If I knew something about you, you know, it's all about not about me imposing something on you, but opening up a conversation that I can find vocabulary language, or we can together, that we understand each other. And then it's about the technical carrying, carrying out of, of that decision, you know, which is slightly more easy part of it. Um, so I had this, uh, uh, you know, I was doing it for, I think it was five pounds I started off with, you know, for a haircut for an hour, you know what I mean? If you were downtown, you'd be paying 50, 100 quid or whatever, you know what I mean? But it was making it accessible to people who couldn't necessarily afford that level of, of hair styling, you know, or cutting or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I also had a waged and an unwaged price. In keeping with, I suppose, the time that we were in, you know, that, you know, with a lot of us were unwaged and the philosophy of perhaps the community arts centre, the grapevine that I was involved with, as well as my background in meeting lefties in London. Uh, but the idea that it's uh, accessible, fair, um, authentic as well, you know, and quality and you know, something that satisfied my soul. I was learning it, I guess, through the learning about the body, you know, in the same way as we learn through clown, we learn through dance or, or movement or whatever, something that is, you know, real about life, you know, or something that is, moves us on to another level. Our thinking is usually way behind our body. Our body is ahead of ourselves, you know, and it's, the, it's where we find the real truth. Um, and about, yeah, fair play in the world. <clears throat> but 
And then, you know, sorry to go back to your question again, but I thought that was worth sticking that in there about, you know, the evolve, how we evolve, how I evolved, you know, and I, mean, I was a clown, yeah, director, you know, teacher. I mean, it, you know, I haven't, I barely have my intercert. No, I think I failed my intercert. I think, I, no, I've passed my intercert five Ds and three Ds in my leaving cert. And now, and they'll hear me say it, I teach MA courses, third level in institutions. You know, I've never taken formal training in acting. It was all an apprenticeship workshop along the way. But it's, they bring me in, of course, not for my academic prowess, <laughs> I can tell you, but more for my practice, you know, as an artist, as a maker, doer, thinker, or whatever, you know, in that sense, as a practitioner, you know. But all that mix, as you say, that, you know, I found, I'll get that, I'll do that, I'll do this, I'll do that, you know, well, I can do that, I can, yeah, give me a go, I'll, you know. I, I would have to go back to my upbringing. You know, I do come from a small town in Garvin County, Waterford, big family, six sisters, one brother. Um, uh, you know, extraordinary family. Um, you know, uh, my dad was, you know, an ultra patriarchal world as we all grew up in the 50s, 60s or whatever, but particularly in my house, I guess. Uh, wonderful upbringing. My dad was everything in the town bar the undertaker, really. You know what I mean? You know, we had a pub with a fish shop. He used to export fish to Holland, actually, salted herrings from Dunmore East. And we had a bit of a farm from his parents, you know, cattle, sheep, pigs, horses. We all rode horses, you know, we kept six horses up in the back of the pub. And, you know, secondhand furniture, plant hire, which is machinery hire kind of thing. He was an auctioneer and valuer. I mean, this is a guy who left school at sixth, sixth class and was, you know, at the time had a business from the forestry. He lived in the country, bringing wood into town and selling it, you know. So in sixth class, he was already a businessman or a business boy. So he couldn't stay anywhere. You know, he was a counselor for a while. I had Fianna Fáil, man. Sure, it's no wonder what I, I am what I am. You know what I mean? With that kind of a background, you know. I'm a Fianna Fáiler, really. Yeah, even though. I, I think it's, it's refreshing to, I think, remind ourselves maybe, I think in the arts now, there's a lot of a sense of maybe people need to do, be doing lots of things. This idea of a portfolio career, lots of different things. And for some people it can be often seen as well. I'm diminishing a primary thing I'm doing by having these other things. And, you know, traditionally you just do one thing and you do it well. I think it's refreshing to hear that actually you know, we've been having portfolio careers for quite some time, quite successfully, and it's not been a problem. But also to hear you talk about, uh, you know, the way in which your career has moved. And two things that came up to my mind has been, when you mentioned a kind of a following of a need, there is a need to go to a place and do a thing, but also that that sort of tempered with, you know, you, you, your values. So there's a sense of uh, authenticity that is unfairness and I, you know, I, I think I spoke to a friend once and said, you know, God, you, couldn't couldn't we all be more successful, really, in some way? And he was like, Well, you could be if you had less values, <laughs> you know. If yeah. you're, you know, and there's something about making a choice with your values that might take you in a different role, but ultimately, I think you need to be linking those two. What are, what are the what are the needs that's happening? How do they sit with the things I really think are important? And that might not take you to Hollywood. But that might be different sets of values actually at play, and they might not yeah. be yours to a degree. So it's been, yeah, it's been, that's what's come across for me to seeing that. But it's just refreshing, I think. And also, you describe that way of, you know, now teaching MA without potentially an intercert. And I think it's really important to hear that and to be reminded that, you know, education works in, in lots of different ways. It's not necessarily the constructed. Here's a degree. In fact, I think we're getting less and less away from that as time goes on. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think it's become more of a piecemeal thing. Yeah. So that, you know, if you have done a thousand things and are not sure that you're lacking because you've not done one, actually, you might be in a position whereby you have such a practice from which now to draw that you could be, you know, mm -hmm. lecturing wherever in places you, you imagine you never would be. Uh, Raymond, thank you so much for your time. I've taken up more than the hour that we've been talking recording but I, oh, I i can't yeah i can't express my gratitude enough for 
for yeah for being open enough to just share your experience and it's been massively enlightening for me at least and i hope for those watching as well that so many insights in there as to how to look at things differently and yeah so my sincere thank you well it's been my absolute pleasure 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 andrew thank you